Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? So this is my first Elixir talk of any kind. So um, I expect it to be a little bit choppy. Um, I expect to get some technical details wrong, but um, I'm, I'm excited about this. Um, so how many of you have read one of the seven in seven books? Maybe seven languages in seven weeks, or just a couple of you. Um, it's an interesting book because um, there aren't many people that know seven languages that they could use in anger. And I certainly didn't. Um, so I was at a conference um, probably about a year and a half ago called Code Mesh, and it was in London. And I was very, um, very excited to meet um, Jose Valim, who, who actually built the Elixir language. And um, I got to meet. I got to meet him for the first time, and I walked up to him, and I had in my hand um, Dave Thomas's book, um, and I said, could you, could you sign this for me, please? And he said, wait a minute, and he, had, he, um, he went to go get the Seven Languages and Seven Weeks book. And so we signed each other's book, and I told him what a big fan that I was, and that um, I, I really liked Elixir because um, it had some of the elements in Seven Languages and Seven Weeks. And, um, and Jose said that seven languages in seven weeks was where he learned Erlang um, and also Lisp, which are two of the big influences in, in Elixir. So um, it, was, it was a really cool, cool point for me. We're going to talk about using pipes in a different way. And um, this, this talk, <laughs> I was told not to, not to pace in front, of the, in front of the light. It kind of limits my... This is my pacing area to, to write about here, but um, I guess I'll live through it. Um, but um, Jose and I were, were trying to work through the idea of how to compose different components of a web application server. Um, so I'm of the firm belief that we're in a functional um, area now, um, and, and you know, Java, so the languages that I've used in production before are Java and Ruby. We have better tools for composing than we had in Java and Ruby. And I'm with the firm, um, I strongly believe that when you put the two words web and framework together, you're probably already wrong, right? So the idea is that I should be able to grab different tools from GitHub to, um, to say, okay, this is what a web connection looks like, um, and now I want to trans um, transform um, an inbound connection to um, say to something that's that's going to um, that's going to support SSL, and then maybe I want to parse parameters, and basically maybe I want to route, and maybe I want to render, and I could stack those things together, right? And to do that, there's a there's a great tool called Pipes, and um, so that kind of planted a seed for for a talk a little while ago. So I asked Jose, I said, okay, give me something. Tell me why you added pipes to the Elixir language. And he said, first, I stole them. I said, come on, Jose, I've got this talk. Give me something. Give me something. Tell, help, help me out a little bit. And he said, well, I hadn't put much thought into it. I said, OK, give me a little more. <laughs> you know, um, because it's, it's become like a big, a big flag for the Ruby community. And he, and he, gave, he went on a little bit more and he said, you know, this is a essential tool for helping to think in a functional way. I said, yeah, that's a little bit more what I'm looking for. And then um, I found a paper that he wrote a little bit later and he said it embodies the transformation of data. And that's what makes functional programming such a powerful thing. We take you know, text and um, add paragraph tags and then add, um, you know, add uh, list tags and order list, and then um, then body tags and H1 to build an H to to build a uh, um, an HTML page. Um, we take raw text and then decorate that with um, with um, I don't know. We uh, we can substitute italics and bold to um, to build a word processor. Um, you know, everything that we do is a series of transformations. And in fact, on the cover of Dave's book. We have um, you know, this, this kind of subtitle that actually has the language construct in it. And I think that that's really cool. 
that says that there is something special going on here. And, um, and that makes you look twice at the book and at the language. And in fact, when Joe Armstrong played with the language for the first time, um, he had this code right here that said, this is easier to read than the Erlang equivalent. And this is a guy who loves the prologue-inspired syntax of Erlang. I was talking a little bit earlier today to, um, to Chris McCord, the creator of Phoenix, and he said, pipes and macros are why I am here with the Elixir language. So what is it about pipes that make things so interesting? Well, in functional programming, if I look at function calls in, in, in a naked way, everything's a little bit backwards. This is an um, a English cliche, um, one step forward and two steps back. And it doesn't really reflect the intention of the programmer very well at all. What I'd really like to do is take this and flip it. And that's what a pipe does. So that if I have something more complicated like this, I can flip it where this is passed as the first ar argument to this, and the result of this is, pa is passed to this, and then I can do an extended transformation. And that's cool. But if you think about it, if you think about a web server, I start with the connection, and then I can enforce SSL, and then I can map on parameters, and then, um, then I pass that to a router, and then I respond with some type of, um, of redirect or, or some type of render. Um, this is really the fundamental problem that made me start thinking about pipes. But there's a couple of problems that are inherent in this kind of transformation that means that we can't use them as often as we would like to. And that's what we're going to talk about today. OK? OK, so the first problem is that I might have some unreliable tasks. right? So maybe I have something that works and something that works. And I pipe that to something that breaks. And then I pipe that to something that works. right? Now, if everything throws an exception, I'm probably OK. Right? Because I'll get works, works, breaks, and that, that'll interrupt the flow, and I can capture the exception up on the top. But in Erlang, does everything throw an exception? Not necessarily, right? What might I get instead? An error tuple, An error tuple right? And so what's the result of running code like this? Well, it's going to run works, works, and then it's going to run breaks, and then it's going to run works. And then I can't do something beautiful like this. I'm dead. Right? So let's express this in another way. <laughs> What's an unreliable process? Well, Russian roulette, right? Um, when this crashes, this is probably really going to crash, right? So and maybe the messages that come out of this are click, click, bang, and click. Now, if this actually follows the rules of Russian roulette, I better not get a click, click, a bang, and a click. But that's exactly what I'm going to get. Right? So this doesn't really follow the rules that I expect it to follow. So I'm surprised and mad and ultimately sad. Right? Because what I'd really like to do is what I, what I know that I have to do to fix this problem is to either corrupt every single function or add extra functions to my piping or wrap functions somewhere in there, or I can corrupt my overall composition. Right? And none of those solutions are a good thing. But with Elixir, I can do something else. right? I can change the operator. This is a big deal, and this changes literally everything. Right? OK, so let's look at macros in a couple of different languages. Let's look at macros in Clojure. 
what's interesting here is this little operator here. This means rather than execute the code right now, I want you to drop this code. So this is a compile time construct. And I'm going to execute this code right now. And it's quoting the if. And that means don't execute that if statement right now. right? So basically, when you look at Lisp or closure macros, you see um, quote and unquote um, macros or, or instructions. And basically, what, that, what they mean is, OK, this should be interpreted, but this might not be interpreted. But since, those, since this might be the result of a function, um, often you can get lost in the various quotes and unquotes, right? But this is a tool that literally changes everything. Here's a demo of the, um, of the macro in Erlang. Well, it's cut and paste, isn't it? Right? And we do this all the time, right? So what's the most common bit of cut and paste code with OTP? Gen server, right? And how do we do that now? This really should have been Emacs. I'm sorry, this, there's a bug in the slide. This should have been an Emacs template, and then, and then everybody's happy. Um, Dave was talking about that today, right? Um, where essentially what we have is a language that isn't rich enough to solve the problem that we needed to solve. Right? Inner macros. OK, so what I'd like to do is build a macro that changes the definition of all the pipes that come after. Right? So inside this block, I'd say, OK, while everything matches this tuple, OK, in the, in the wild car, I'm going to um, call, click, click, bang, and click. And I'd like it to execute up to here and stop. OK? <coughs> so this is what we're after. This is the macro that we're going to build. And note, there's a couple of rules that I want this to follow. I don't want that last click to be prematurely executed. I want to preserve the syntax of the, the pipe operator and that preserves my intent, right? That makes my intent crystal clear. And because of these two rules, this has to be a macro. There's not another way in the language to accomplish the task. OK? So what is a macro? A macro is something that executes at compile time. It's going to potentially change the syntax tree. And since this is true, this is an especially powerful tool for building templates of codes, like OTP gen servers, right? So when, so basically, in the Erlang community, we've gotten used to the idea that when we have a problem that's repetitive, we either reach for the cut and paste key, or we reach for a um, an editor macro, right? What we'd really like to do is build something and the language that can take full advantage, right? OK, so basically, in this application, up here on the top somewhere, I'm going to have something that says use pipe, right? And when that happens, this is going to call this macro here um, called using, right? And in this case, all I'm going to do is drop in by helicopter this little line of code that says import pipe. And you notice that this is inside a quote do block. Right? So basically what's happening is that quote do um, says that, OK, stop the world, drop this code into the syntax tree, and then you see the end there. Um, so I'm lifted back out of quote do, and then I start executing code again. Right? Um, and then I have the other def macro calls for the explicit macros like pipe while that I want that I actually want to build. So let's look at one of those. So this one is um, is the pipe matching macro, right? And if you think about it, the difficult part about writing a macro is keeping the scope in your head. There are two scopes that we're interested in here. One is the compile time scope. 
So when this code is compiled, what, um, what variables, what is active at that time, right? The second scope is the runtime scope. And the runtime scope is basically everything that's inside of the quote, right? So you can also look at it like a, like a cruise ship. So I might be on one particular level. This might be the compile time level of the cruise ship. And I might have to go a level down or a level up to, to uh, work my way around the engine room to get to another part of the cruise ship, right? So I think of things, invisibility in terms of levels, right? So for example, level one, these are things that the compiler can see, right? So basically, it's going to, when, when um, I execute this macro, this is going to fire, and then I'm going to quote. So basically, this code will not be interpreted except the stuff that I run across when I unquote, because that comes back up a level, right? So in this case, what we're trying to do is drop this code into the application rather than the, um, the pipe, well, this, this is the, the code that we'll drop in when we're doing a pipe, right? So pipe while has the arguments. Um, there's the expression that, that, we want to, that we want to match, right? That OK wildcard. And then there's the pipes, right? So in this case, I want, to, uh, I want a pipe while, and then I'm going to build an anonymous function that's going to say, do I match, does this pipe match the um, expression, right? And then, um, and then I'm going to drop in the, the rest of the pipes, right? And um, what's interesting is I've actually defined the first macro in terms of a second macro, right? So pipe matching is actually going to call this pipe while. Well, what does the pipe while look like? Well, we have a strategy here. We're basically going to take the pipes apart, and we're going to keep um, firing the pipes as long as, um, as long as they match the internal conditions, right? So the way that I do this is I essentially have an outer macro, and that's going to call a private function that does most of the work, right? The outer macro is a reduce step, and remember, uh, um, reduce takes um, you know some type of some type of primitive and a function, and um, and you know combines them all together recursively. So, for example, if you had a list of one, two, and three, and you had a reduce with plus, which is a function, um, then it would add add all of them together, right? Um, so basically, this takes the pipes apart, and then I'm going to pass this reduce if function, which is my private function, which has um, the accumulator, some type, of, um, some type of function, which is the reduce function, and some type of test, which is the mass matching function that we passed in earlier. Right? You guys following me so far? So now let's look at the private function. So remember, we're on a cruise ship, and we need to think in terms of where the visibility is, right? So right now, we are in compile time visibility. But let's dive in and let's look at the code that we want to inject at runtime, right? In this case, we don't want to unpack the, this attribute twice, right? Because that could fire the code twice. So I say, OK, um, this accumulator, um, I unpack the code here with the unquote. And then um, basically I have a test, right? Um, if if um, my test is true, then go ahead and unpipe the macros. Otherwise, do nothing and continue. And then it will be true for the rest of the cycle because I'll continue um, to return just the accumulator. Right? So that's really all there is to it. So there's really, once you, once you um, get set in, in your head that there are two levels of, of scoping that you have to pay attention to. The compile time scope and the runtime scope, things get a whole lot easier. Okay? So the code in black is really what's going to get injected here. And the code in green is actually um, macro code that's going to be um, 
dynamically executed at compile time. Right? And so when I run the code, I get click, click, and bang. The last, um, the last element isn't, um, isn't executed at all, which is exactly the behavior that we're after. OK. So we just talked about pipe matching. And pipe matching solved the problem where we wanted um, a much more uniform experience with the return codes. And I can actually see that work here. OK. Uh, OK, so off the screen, you would see um, click, click, and bang. Sorry about that. And let's go back to here. OK, so let's move on to the next problem. Um, so sometimes pipe while and pipe, and pipe matching aren't enough for me. Sometimes I want to map more sophisticated behaviors around, around the whole pipe. Like, for example, what if I want to make my return codes much more uniform, right? Like, what happens if something works and something works and something breaks, but this breaks, breaks in a way that's not uniform, right? Maybe it has a, a tuple, and maybe it throws an exception, right? So the best way to solve that would be to wrap all of my exceptions into something that caught the exception and turn that into an error in the exception tuple. Right? Well, fixing this problem makes me sad, right? Because if I do something like, like this that raises the exception, um, now I can't have a uniform, now I don't have a uniform, um, uniform example anymore. I, I have to catch that on the outside, right? What I'd much rather do is have the semantics of that exception um, captured here, and I'd like to be able to do, um, deal with that in the context of the pipe. So I'm going to, so basically the problem is this exception here. Okay. So what I'd like to be able to do is build this exception wrapper, right? This exception wrapper captures the exception and translates it into, um, into a tuple. And then I can wrap that with a macro to pipe width. Right? And now I'm passing my exception wrapper. And so every single function in this pipeline will be wrapped with my exception wrapper. Right? It's not just exceptions that we're working with here. What if I'm working with matrix algebra? Right? So I've got a matrix, and I want to follow that with plus one and times two, and multiply everything in that matrix by, uh, by that amount, or add everything in that matrix by that amount. We could all write that code in our head, right? What we don't want to do is corrupt our functions, right? We want to say, pipe width, and then have write the code one time to deal with that major matrix algebra, and then throw the function at every single thing, every single column in the matrix. Right? So let's say we have a list here. And then basically, I want to pipe plus one and times two and have that work on every everything in the um, in the list, right? Or maybe I have a matrix that's arbitrarily deep. And I don't want to pipe operators at that. Right? Really, what I'm doing is I'm taking this pipeline and I'm wrapping a function around it at every single step. That's cool. So this is accomplished a whole lot like we accomplished the pipe while, right? 
we're going to do it with pipe matching. And in this case, we're doing another reduce, except instead of doing reduce if, we're doing a reduce with. Right? So we're going to wrap everything, every function that comes through in the same function. So in this case, the reduce with is the, is the thing that's changing here. And again, we want to see what's, we want to differentiate what's happening on the outside at compile time. There's really not much behavior there with what's happening at runtime. And at runtime, we have an inner function, which in this case is the F1 and the F2. And we have an outer function, which in this case, it was that G function, right? So basically, the inner function, um, this function right here is what, we're, is what we're piping with, right? FUN is what we're piping with. Is that the inner or the outer function? Yes, that's basically the exception wrapper that we want to wrap around the outside, right? And the inner function is basically the function that's going to come through with each pipe segment, right? So when we do our reduce, we have an unpipe that takes the first pipe, that basically takes the pipes apart, right? And we're reducing that with, um, with the first argument, which is an accumulator, which is the value that we've computed so far, and the rest of the pipeline, and the function that we're piping with, OK? So we have our pipe, pipe segment, our accumulator, and we have our outer function. And, um, and basically, all we have to do is unquote, and that makes this, uh, um, that makes this visible at, um, at compile time, right? So we're go going to pipe them together um, with the segment. Um, and basically, all we've done is build an anonymous inner function, right? And basically, we wrap that anonymous inner function with an outer function, and we're done. Right? So now, for my matrix math, all I have to do is some enum maps in here. Right? Basically, I can merge list, which is merges a single list, and then merge lists, which merges a bunch of lists. And, um, and then I can, um, basically, I can use this as a wrapper to do my matrix math the same way that I used a wrapper to wrap my exceptions, right? Now, all I have to do is build a list and call pipe with, merge list, and then I can take the list, pass it plus one, and pass it, pass it times two, and it just works, right? I can take a matrix, which is multiple levels deep, and pass it, take the matrix, pass it plus one and times two, and it just works. Okay. So basically, what we've done is um, we've said that programming is thinking. Pipes express that thinking in transformation steps, right? And the macros define the way that pipes held things together. And that's all I've got. Questions? Yes? So I thought you called the macro that pipe and then kind of an unpipe and pipe. Like yes. Um, are we able to mesh out these pipes in both the way you said we can? Is, is, that, is there a limitation of that sort built into language? Because I assume there is. Um, yeah, so basically, um, basically the, the pipe and unpipe are expressions that, that, um, that are built into the language to make these things accessible to us at runtime, right? I mean, so basically, if we wanted to, we could go parse the syntax tree, and we would see that inside out function. But what we'd rather do is we'd rather, uh, so um, Jose has written these macros that basically reverse it to us so that we have the same benefits as macro programmers as you have as an Elixir programmer that basically um, translates those things in order. Um, and have you encountered any situations where it wasn't reasonable from that macro? Uh, yes, actually, um, Dave has encountered a few of those situations. Dave was actually rewriting some of the assertion 
um, macros in the test framework. And um, you know, you're basically parsing a syntax tree here, right? And with Lisp, so we actually had this conversation um, yesterday afternoon. Um, in Lisp, the syntax tree and the language um, and the language structure are one and the same, right? Now, the cool thing about Elixir is actually one of the drawbacks of Elixir, right? This is the first time that we've seen, to my knowledge, that we have macros in a language where the, um, the syntactic representation is, um, is divorced from the syntactic, or is divorced from the data structure, the AST, right? And the benefit, um, we have a uniform AST um, that, that is, is the same all the way down, right? It's, it's a nested data structure. The drawback is that since those are a little bit different, it's sometimes difficult to reason about, um, about, about the code. Yes, you can. So basically, what you're dealing with is, in every single line, I didn't go into this on purpose, but every single line of Elixir code is a three-tuple. It's, um, it's the operator, um, which is often a function call. It's some metadata, like line numbers and, um, and debugging information and things like that. And then it's the arguments, right? And um, you, can, you can imagine that, um, that nested function calls work exactly the same way. Everything is just a nested data structure. Okay, so then my last question is the next one. Yep. Um, in the computer's macro, can you like track the pattern? Because like when you're building a macro, you have a whole bunch of different tables. Yes. Do you have further macros that you can build? Like can you Yes, and you saw one right here. You saw that pipe and unpipe are macros that um, that actually help deal with the, the syntax tree. Well, it, it seemed that that's so, like coming back to your tree tip analogy, it yep. seemed that there's so many things you could run in there. Yes. Can you keep on you know, diving deeper and deeper and deeper? Yeah, um, so, so the question is that um, can, with, with my cruise ship analogy, I said you could climb down one level. We never climb down two levels. C can you ever climb down two levels and climb up a level? Well, sometimes, or actually quite often, when you're dealing with more sophisticated macros, you want to break things into smaller macros or functions, right? And when you do that, you have to be very careful that you understand how far down you've quoted or how far down you've, or how far back up you've thumbed, right? You might want to put two levels of quotes around something and then take one level off. Um, but you want to run, you want to wind up with, <laughs> with the right, you want to wind up on the right level of the, the cruise ship. So this ties back to my original question. Yes. There's nothing on memory. There's some convenience added by the memory, and the convenience is invoked by the node. The syntax tree is wide open. There are a couple of um, kind of structural caveats. Like, for example, um, you can imagine that everything in the syntax tree is a three tuple. You can imagine also that if you were to pass some code that was a hard-coded three-tuple, you might have some confusion, right? What's actually, you know, what's, what's um, syntax in the tree versus what's a hard-coded three-tuple? Um, so you have to do some, you have to play some games to, to solve that problem. Yeah, Dave? I think he wants to ask, is there anything I can't do with yeah, the syntax I, I tree? I'm just trying to understand the limits of where they run. And that's great that you can have that. That is a limit. And that's probably the main, that's probably the reason. But I think the answer is, is there something that I can do with the syntax tree? I think the answer is no. I can, I can work directly on the syntax tree. And macros are just a convenient abstraction to help me do that. Um, other questions? And you, you guys can tell that I'm learning this um, as you guys are. Well, not that guy. Did I get that right, Jose? I think so. Sometimes it's still kind of obvious, too. Yeah. But regarding the something regarding the data is that there are ways to show that a separator, you can hide the separator, and should switching operators be a lot better along with the data?
so once it's defined, it's defined, right? It's, it's a, you know, it's, you basically have a compile time pass, which winds up to be a multi-pass, um, multi-pass basically for each, you know, using, right? Do you guys remember the using macro, the underscore, underscore using? That actually got fired every time that, um, that we encountered a use. More questions? It's really, this is really the key to, to what Elixir brings to the table. Really, it's, it's tremendously exciting because it's really the first time that we have a language with a richer syntax that we've kind of, we have a, a, a steady, uniform syntax tree. We have the rules for building that syntax tree. We have a quoting and unquoting structure for templating that allows us to have a rich syntax and the full macro capability um, for, for templating our own solutions, right? And, and what, that do, what that does for us is it, it essentially changes everything. That means that when we find out that the language is not rich enough to do things like gen servers, we, can, we have a second shot at it, right? We can build macros that can dry that stuff up, right? So for that reason, I think that the Erlang community is going to be using Elixir a lot, even people that like Erlang syntax and, and like what Erlang does to them and does for them, right? So. Um, I'm actually a big Erlang fan, but I think that we're going to find a lot of places where you build DSLs around the outside and where you build configuration um, in, in Elixir because it's the right tool for the job. Yeah? I was going to say, to your point about building DSLs, there's an Elixir Reddit slack that has just a ton of repetitive, I want to define a, an operation that I can call on Reddit, and then it's the exact same call over and over and over and over again. Because we've got something that we Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so Jose and I were working at, um, at this I idea that a web framework is essentially, we've bound these, we've coupled things together that don't belong coupled together. Does that make sense? What we really needed to do is define the concept of what a connection looks like. And once we've defined what a connection looks like, then we can compose them in interesting ways. And one of the macros that, that we, we toyed with is, is building, you know, plug that, that wraps this concept, plug that wraps the, the second concept. And the plug could, could be um, a call into an Erlang library. It could be a straight function. Um, basically, it was an abstraction. It could be another stack of plugs, right? But when you start thinking in terms, in these kinds of terms, and when you start thinking in ways that can be composed like this, and you're not bound by the original language and the rules of the original language when you start to compose, things get really powerful very quickly. Yes? I know when uh, the Erlang is passed, it's a direct to pass of the time and then it kind of unfolds the macros to help you understand what to write. So basically we can do that. We can essentially quote and unquote things at, at runtime. So you can actually see um, what an expansion looks like. Is there something that happens at compile time that we see at compile time, Jose? There's also a macro send, and then you have like, you have the, the macro instead of sending to you, it's like you have a dependent. Yeah, so these are, so basically if you can see um, the way things are quoted, the way things are unquoted, and you can see what the final um, version of the code is trying to do, um, 
you basically have a pretty full stack. I'm not saying that this stuff is easy. This was, I mean, it's basically 10 lines of code that uh, took me about a week and a half, two weeks to write. It's, it was just I'm insane. Just, I'm just looking for a map of the food chain. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's what, so, so there's a tension between the Erlang and the Elixir communities for this reason, right? One community wants to be very explicit about the things we do. One community thinks that um, you know, there's a necessary tension when you decide that you want to be dry, when you don't want to repeat yourself. There's a necessary tension that can be solved with macros and that there's a place for them. Right? But think about, put yourself in Brian, did, who, who saw the, um, the ad, um, ad world? Presentation, uh, what was that, uh, 10, 10 billion transactions yeah. a second, <laughs> you know, I don't know, <laughs> a day or whatever, right? Um, so, so basically, if he adopts Elixir, he's adding a level of complexi complexity that, um, that's terrifying for him, right? Maybe it's not such a good tool to be using, maybe it's better to have a little bit of extra cut and paste so that I can be explicit, and the developer's intention is crystal clear, right? But maybe in such a system, around the parameter, maybe there's some configuration, maybe there's some domain-specific um, language that we could do to integrate this thing with the outside world, right? In such a world, it's possible even valuable for Erlang and Elixir to coexist. More comments and questions. Yeah. So I played around with macros enough to do that one thing to understand how something would break in the code that I wrote. Yeah. So a macro essentially just it takes a series of parameters that may be exposed in a type thing, right? Right. And it it returns a new abstract syntax for each of those parameters. So yes. And basically, the macro allows us, gives us a template language. It's a mail merge program, yeah. right? It says, this is code, and then I'm going to do some mail merge. The problem is that you can be running some code that does the merge, right? And that code might execute at compile time or runtime. And that's what makes things confusing. But you could, in theory, take an abstract syntax that's twice as dense as macro, right? And that's precisely. Yes. Go change the AST literally by modifying the data and return You can only do that um, uh, that until the compile pass is the, the compiler pass is finished. Is that correct, Jose? So uh, so basically the question is can I modify to, can I just modify the syntax tree directly anytime that I want to? So there's, so you had two built-in questions. The first question was, can I model, can I modify the AST directly? The answer is yes. Um, and what are the limitations around that? And that's what Jose just answered. Yes. Yeah, so basically getting your head wrapped around quote and unquote what level in the world you're in is sometimes a little more difficult. It's it's compiling it's it's compiling the stuff inside of quote and shoving that in straight into the ASD. That's this is part this is a living breathing part of the compile time pass. Yeah. Yeah.
I can't, but the guy standing next to you can. So can you repeat the question first, Jose? Yes. So do you guys catch what's going on here? So basically, one of the questions is, um, is related to how does Haskell handle um, this type of concern? So Haskell has something called a maybe monad, which means that um, sometimes I might, might return a null, and sometimes I might return um, a value, right? And, and the maybe allows, um, allows us to manage both types at the same time. And what Jose is saying is that this particular solution, this pipe matching solution, um, emulates so that we've basically broken um, our own primitive type into a tuple. And that's, that's essentially what we've done here. Well, monadic type properties, yeah. yeah. Like, that's cool. Like, yeah. With, <laughs> With macros, right? Um, yeah, it's not nearly as cool as the the Haskell stuff, but yeah, it, it's cool. So I'm sorry, did I? So the thing is that if I have many lines, so Haskell allows me to express very small monads, right? Yes. So, so a great analogy is that the, the Erlang community and the Java community um, have, have something in common. And that's that there, there is a wall that's being hit with complexity in terms of the amount of duplication, right? Java handled that problem with things like aspect J and bytecode enhancement and things like that. Um, and and uh, Elixir is adding this capability through the macros. We have to wrap up. Yeah, it's a great discussion, but sorry, we've got to begin the next talk. So <coughs> thank you.
thank you